Good evening, mga ka-investa. JC here. Uh, I'm with Ray. This is the third video that we're going to discuss on REITs. Uh, the last video, we did an overview on a REIT. Ngayon naman, uh, sasagutin natin yung karamihan ng mga tanong nyo kasi sa comment box, marami mga tanong on the details of a REIT. And actually, dito rin namin mapapakita paano ba magbasa ng isang prospectus. Kasi usually, tayong mga retail traders, lalo na yung mga technical or short-term traders, kapag dating sa disclosures or mga financial statements or mga fundamental information, tumatakbo na tayo kasi inisip natin sobrang complicated niya. Uh, sa video na to, kasama ko si Ray, ang ating research analyst sa Investagrams. Iga-guide namin kayo kung paano ba ma mapadali yung pagbasa ng prospectus. And in this case, we're gonna analyze the prospectus of a REIT. So what I'm sharing right now is yung prospectus ni a REIT. You can see it's actually 875 pages. And when you see that number, it's quite it's quite intimidating, di ba? Parang paano ko babasahin lahat yan? And the quick answer is, hindi mo naman babasahin talaga lahat yan. So just to show you ano bang laman nitong prospectus, an overview, di ba? So, of course, meron tayong table of contents. Nandito yung summary ng offering, mga risk factors, and investing in this particular A-REIT. Meron silang dividend policy. Dadaan natin mamaya. Meron silang profit forecast and profit projection. Some other details and then discussion ng mga results nila previously. And then ito, very, very lengthy discussion on each business, on each, oh, sorry, on each property na kasama sa A-REIT. And then meron din silang market overview yung mga Metro Manila office market in, in particular. So that will take mga the first 400 pages, pero we're not gonna, we don't have to read all of that again. So just to give you an idea, no? after the first 400 pages, darating ka sa appendix nila. And yung appendix nila, yun yung second 400 plus pages. So laman ng appendix would be mga audited financial statements. So this example right here, audited financial statements nila for March 31, 2020, one quarter. And then meron din sila audited financials hanggang 2017. And then after ng audited financials, meron silang reinvestment plan ni Ayala Land. So saan ba gagamitin ni Ayala Land itong proceeds ng REIT, di ba? So yan, nilist na niya dito lahat ng, lahat ng properties up until 2023 kung saan niya gagamitin yung proceeds. And then after that, meron yung valuation report ni Asian Appraisal. I think na-mention na rin natin to the last video. And sa valuation report ito, makikita mo lahat ng assumptions, lahat ng discussions on the property, paano ba nila value, paano sila dumating sa 30 billion pesos. And then finally, after nitong valuation report, meron tayong portion here which is yung... Wait, ang haba pala nito. <laughs> ito. So, meron tayong independent market research report prepared by Colliers on Metro Manila office sector. So, there are some important points here which we will also go through later. So, for now, let's start with itong discussion natin sa prospectus. First thing I'd want to highlight here is ito. So, ano bang investment criteria ni AREIT? Ito. Lahat ng potential new properties na ipapasok nila na part ng AREIT should be located in a prime location in either Metro Manila or key provinces like Cebu, for example. It has to be primarily commercial properties, meaning offices. And then these properties should have stable occupancy, tenancy, and stable income. Okay? So ito yung properties na minention rin natin in the previous video. May office building, may mixed-use building, for mostly for BPOs, and then may other office building. So after these three properties, part ng proceeds will be used to acquire itong ito, Teleperformance Cebu. So it's an office tower in Cebu. Mostly, ayan, BPO offices, PESA accredited, as, PESA accredited as well. And then after that, ito, part pa rin ng summary. One thing I want to highlight, ang sabi nila, we believe that our company, AREIT, offers shareholders an investment opportunity with the following benefits. So ito raw yung benefits ng pag-invest sa AREIT. Number one na hinighlight nila is a stable yield meaning stable returns ng investment mo. In other prospectuses, baka makita mo, ang highlight nila is growth ng company. Sa kanila, sa A-REIT, ang highlight is stable yield. And then we go to ito. And it's stable yield because primarily yung distributable, sorry, yung distribution ng 
dividends. It's 90% of distributable of distributable income, as I'm sure you guys already know. Narindaba. Other points to highlight in this prospectus: top 10 largest tenants nila contributed 74% of rental income last year, 2019. For the first quarter this year, top 10 tenants 78%. So medyo concentrated, no. So some points we can see this as a risk. But just like us traders, now we have risk management protocols and procedures, diba? Sala as corporates and companies, they also have, they also have ways to manage these risks, and we'll talk about that later on. Then, and then next highlight we have ito, Asian appraisal valued the properties as of June's 2020 at 30 billion pesos. Mostly, yung value nato ng gagaling from Solaris One and Ayala North Exchange, 12 billion and 16 billion respectively. So yung McKinley Exchange, 2 billion pesos lang, and it's because it's quite a small building versus the other two. And then, ito, next point I want to highlight, just from, we're just scanning yung mga stuff sa prospectus nila, diba? Ito yung so summary rents, part, no? Yeah. Our rents are fixed and apply uniformly across the lease terms. So fixed yung rent. And then, if mag pre-terminate ka ng lease mo, may steep penalties. So magkaka income palalo si Aerit pag umalis ka, and then they have, of course, they have time to look for the new tenants to replace you, diba? So that's one way to mitigate, to mitigate itong risk na may 10 large tenants contributing 74%. So if any of them leave ahead of time, ahead of schedule, ayan, may steep penalty, part ng contract yan. Add ko lang siguro, kasi maraming natatakot eh, dahil diba COVID, sa Makati, office rin namin Makati, maraming nagsasarado. So, mm -hmm. Yung mga low low quality offices, oo, marami yung mga malilit na companies. Pero I think iba talaga yung prime ni Ayala. Eh. So, kumbaga, siya yung last na tatamaan dito. Pero nakita naman natin, 98% yung occupancy nung pinaka, yung third building niya, yung dalawa, 100%. And even in the next one, two years, mataas pa rin yung occupancy rate. So, walang effect halos. Tapos, eto pa, yung, yung pag may umalis, mababayaran rin si Ali. So, very protected siya. Yeah, yeah, as you mentioned, last three years, average occupants nila 98.3%. So that's a good part na low risk and if you talk if you think about it that way. But there's there's also another aspect to this na there's minimal upside left. Because you can't get more tenants, you're almost at 100 percent So yung growth san manga san manga it's primarily from yung increase in rental rates or if they acquire, if they infuse more properties dito sa rate na to. Diba? And okay. then, ito, another highlight, average inflation daw since 2014 is at 2.7%. Meanwhile, yung leases nila, yung lease contracts nila, generally subject to annual escalation of 3 to 10%. So every year, itong mga fixed rates nila nag increase by 3 to 10%, which is higher than inflation. Right? Okay, so then, sasabi rin natin na yung parang kung assuming parati siyang fully occupied, then rental escalation na lang yung way niya to increase the rates no kung hindi siya magdagdag ng building so conservatively yes. 3 to 10% yung growth niya kada taon assuming full occupancy and walang building na madadagdag so at least tatak natin sa utak yun para alam natin yung expectation dito and then just to mention then hindi lang sa pagdagdag ng building possible din na nagii-improve nila yung spaces nila and that's another way to increase yung rates no para you're not just going with the market mm -hmm. And then, yeah, so that's yung summary ng offering ng, ng, ng business nila. We move to yung next part. Ito, this is another 40 pages, risk factors. This is standard naman across all prospectus, even mga bond offerings. Now, they list down all of the risks na any investor might um, or should consider when they invest in A-REIT, in, in whatever is being offered. So, of course, marami dito mga standard lang. We are exposed to risks inherent in the Philippines, stuff like that. So, if you want... If you have time, you can read through the headings, yung mga nakabold. Pero for this particular video, we just want to highlight a few risks. So in particular, ito, the fund manager has no experience managing a REIT. And that's fair to say naman kasi no company in the Philippines has experience managing REITs kasi wala pa ngang REITs in the Philippines, diba? And then next naman, we have ito, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Yep. So of course, may risk pa rin to sa business nila. But... It's good. This is one risk that I think is worth reading in full. But some points to highlight. Ito, as of date, this re as of date of this read plan, so July of 2020, COVID-19 has had a limited impact on A REIT. 
And that's because retail spaces is only 6% of total leasable area. So mostly, yung tenants talaga nila are BPOs. And that's majority of their ayan, tenants, di ba? So kaya gets natin na wala masyadong impact yung COVID-19. Kasi again, naka -con nasa contract naman tong mga to. And it's a fixed rate. Hindi siya dependent sa income ng or sa sales ng tenant, di ba? And then what else can we highlight from here? So ito, they, we mentioned earlier, may appraisal, may appraised value yung properties nila from Asian appraisal, 30 billion pesos. Of course, that might be different from yung actual realizable value, subject to change. If you ask another appraisal, appraiser company to value these properties, it might be a bit different. Pero ayun, they listed naman yung actual assumptions na ginamit ni Asian appraisal to value these. So ito. They assume growth rates for rent at 5%, 4%, some at 2% for the next 10 years. Diba? And then if you want more details on yung, on yung assumptions na ginamit ni Asian Appraisal, you can go to the appendix. Nandun yung full report nila. And it's very, very detailed. You can actually recreate their valuation just by reading through their full report. But again, that's quite a long report then. So something to consider lang. Another risk. This is the very first REIT in the Philippines, so we don't have a benchmark yet. We don't have a pure benchmark of how these perform, specifically in the Philippines. That's why in the previous video, pinakita natin, diba, ano bang performance ng REITs in neighboring countries instead, right? But uh, something to highlight then is, because this is the first REIT, they're paving the way for more REITs to follow. That's something I believe in. Uh, in the future, we could see the likes of Mega World, SM. They will most likely also offer REITs. And then finally, let's answer this uh, question, or let's try to answer this question, diba? Dividends and dividend policy. Maraming yung nagtatanong, and it's a very good question. Um, how often will they pay out dividends? Magbibigay sila quarterly or once a year lang? So by law, ang, ang requirement ng REIT law is to distribute at least 90% of net income plus some adjustments, diba? Pero itong sinabi nila, such distribution must not be later than the last working day of the fifth month following the close of the fiscal year. Ang haba ng sinabi. Pero basically, what this means is, dapat ma-distribute nila in full yung 90% latest end of May every year. Kasi December 31 yung fiscal year nila. Okay? And then, just some additional points. However, itong audited financial statements, it's not a requirement. So, hindi kailangan na full year may results ka na before you can distribute quarterly or semi-annual semi dividends. So, ang sinasabi nito is pwede silang mag-distribute quarterly, semi-annual, but uh, it's, pero they haven't specified yet kung ano exactly yung plan nila. And that's one thing, yes, I also haven't seen online yet. So, siguro appeal na lang sa mga ka-invest na natin, sa mga viewers, no? If may na-encounter na kayong official statement from Ayala Management or mga research reports that say na ito yung plan nila, quarterly pala sila mag-release, i-provide na natin sa comments para magtulungan tayo among us investors, di ba? Yeah, so, so wala pang direct na sagot dyan, whether annual ba, semi-annual, or quarterly. So, usually, baka ilabas na lang nila yan pag lumapit na yung offer or natapos na yung offering. Let's see. Yeah. And then, something to note lang din, regionally, outside the Philippines, what we're seeing is companies, REITs rather, they, they offer, sorry, they pay out dividends at least quarterly, sometimes even more frequent, mga special dividends. So, yun lang, they just have to be mindful lang na they don't exceed yung maximum dividends na they can pay out for a year. And with a business like this, it's very stable. Yes, you can, you should have um, a good idea on projections for the next few months, for the next year ng business mo. So, yan, diba? it's possible na quarterly siya, it's possible na semi-annual, it's also possible na annual. So, again, appeal natin if you guys are able to find uh, an article, something that says officially ito yung plan, uh, pakicomment na lang, pakishare sa other investors. Diba? And then, next significant part nitong prospectus, ito, profit forecast and profit projection nila for the next two years, up until 2021. So, si Airit, nag-prepare sila ng projections and then they had it examined pa by SGV, yung auditor. So, it's in projections line summary, no? So, meron silang for the last five months of this year, and then meron din sila for 2021. So, for 2021, para full year yung basis natin, they expect 1.7 billion pesos of rental income. And then, they projected yung costs, yung net income, and then, wala masyadong tax na babayaran, that's part of the REIT law. 
And once you have yung net income mo, you can make the yung mga adjustments tapos aabot ka sa dividends na ibabayad mo for the year. So for 2020, ang expected or ang projected dividends na ibabayad nila is at 1.3 billion pesos. For 2021, it's at 1.6 billion pesos. And then you get yung dividends per share, 1.31. And 1.58 for 2020 and 2021, respectively. No? Ilang percent growth rate nun? So that is, kita ba to? Itong pinapakita ko, 1.38 over 1.31. Hindi, hindi, hindi kita yung calculation. Ah, okay, sige. So that's around 20% growth for the next year. So that's significant then, di ba? Okay. And then, nagcompute na rin sila. Given these offer prices, may ranges, may ranges sila ng binigay. So at 30.05, ito yung maximum offer price nila, yung dividend yield is 4.36%. How do you compute that? Basically, it's 1.31 divided by 30.05 equals 4.36%. So that's for 2020. Right now, we know na yung offer price is 27, di ba? Ang binigyan nila dito is 27.05, pero sobrang lapit na, lang, sobrang lapit na rin naman yun, di ba? So at 27 pesos per share, Ang dividend yield that we're looking at is 4.8% for 2020 and 5.8% for 2021. Okay? So, yan, alam na natin yung indicative range nila. And then, ito, assumptions net. They also laid out yung assumptions, paano sila nag arrive at 1.7 billion rental income for 2021, ano yung mga costs, stuff like that. So, ayun, they laid out the assumptions. If kung gusto niyong daanan, pwede rin naman, di ba? Pero just some stuff we want to highlight. So, most of the revenues, the rental income, will come from Solaris One and Ayala North Exchange. And logical naman kasi these are the two tallest buildings that they have. And then, something to note then, itong Teleperformance Cebu, they factored it into their projections na. And it's going to contribute 5%. 8% of revenue. So, medyo maliit lang din tong building na to na, na ina-acquire, ia-acquire pala nila. Okay? And then, they also computed yung net asset value. So, ito yung value ng REITs or ng company minus yung mga liabilities nila. Right now, they have zero long-term debt. Pero they, have, they still have mga few liabilities, of course. So, net asset value per share based on yung accounting books nila is at 33.3 pesos. So, offer price 27. So, right now, they're offering it at discount to yung value ng REIT or ng company. And then, some other stuff. Ito, nasa business section na tayo. Breakdown ng leasable area nila. Kita natin, BPOs contribute 66%. And then, mga headquarter offices. Service departments. Ito yung SEDA residents. Uh, service departments na minensyon na natin sa previous videos. And then, meron silang retail component, ito yung 6 to 7%. And basically, these are there because, syempre, may mga offices ka, may employees yan. You want to provide them options for places they can eat, stuff like that, diba? So, that's the breakdown ng leasable area. Tenant profile, they also listed out sino ba yung mga tenants na yan na part ng building nila. Ito, 86% ng tenants nila nandito na sa list na to. 86% by leasable area. So, yung space na ino-occupy nila. Number one on their list is Shell Shared Services. So, since shared service siya, it classifies under BPO, diba? business processing. They also have itong service department, which is yung SEDA. And then, more of ito, mga BPOs and one banking financial institution. So, just some more breakdowns of their office, sino bang, of their leasable area. And then, ito. This is a very good point and a very interesting point. It's yung weighted average lease expiry, wale, whale, however you want to pronounce it, is at 5.84 years. Ano bang ibig sabihin ng metric na to, no? And why is this an important metric to us as investors or as prospective investors? So itong 5.84 years, it means na on average, take mo lahat ng tenants ng building nila and then uh, yeah, get the weighted average of that. How long do they have left in their lease contracts. Right now, or sorry, yeah, as of May 30, 2020, yung average remaining term ng, con ng lease contracts nila is 5.8 years. So, kita natin medyo matagal pa. We saw some comments saying, hala, two years left na lang yan eh. Delikado yan sa COVID. Magsisialisan yung mga yan. In reality, it's actually 5.8 years pa. 
and again this ties in with yung earlier point na sinabi natin na if gusto nila mag terminate may steep penalty so that's one risk that's one way na Aerit Ayala is managing their risks diba ayun so napaka importante niyan yung whale 5.84 years basically lahat ng tenants pag in average mo more than 5 years pa yung contract na natitira sa kanila so kahit nakita natin na na 70 plus percent ay nasa 10 kumpanya lang yung kontrata ng mga to ay 5 years pa 5 years pa yung running and even if may fears tayo na covid work from home yung bagong normal etc or bpos magkaroon ng bago sa business model uh, naka-contract naman yan na limang taon pa. So not unless they pre-terminate or ma-bankrupt sila. Doon lang mag iba Pero again, um, either scenario, protected pa rin si A-REIT sa, sa ganito. So it would take a big, big uh, event para lang ma-disrupt yung, ano niya, yung, yung contracts niya. So medyo secured na siya at this point. Yep. And even right now, this is... COVID, of course, is a big event and nakaka-disrupt siya. Pero five years, diba? That's a lot of time to recover for these businesses and yeah. a lot of time to look for new tenants if you need, diba? Yep. And then, just some more details. They have, on a per-building basis, sino yung tenants niyan? So, ito yung sa Solaris One. Ito naman yung sa Ayala ex- North Exchange. So, kung gusto yung daanan isa isa, if you really want to do your due diligence, you can with this document kasi sobrang haba nga niya. And then, meron din silang nilayout itong mga strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, or SWOT. I guess this is a very common form of analysis, itong SWOT analysis. Even mga students, they do this all the time in their classes. So, some weaknesses they, they pointed out. This one in particular is for Solaris 1. Ito, visibility. It's not directly in Aya- along Ayala Avenue. This one is nasa De La, De La Rosa. And then, accessibility. Ayun nga, it's not... It's not directly connected to Ayala Avenue. And then, hindi din daw siya directly connected dun sa yung walkway along, along Ayala. Itong walkway, I think, is yung the one that connects Greenbelt all the way to Ayala North Exchange, diba? And then, ito, they mentioned some other weaknesses ng building mismo and then some of their rates. Itong, ito yung mga other fees na sina charge nila outside the lease contract. So, parking Pahit fee, air conditioning nila. charges. Three, tama ba? Yeah. 300 yung kusa nila. 390. Yep. So, they mentioned nga, it's above market. So, if this is a consideration for prospective tenants, it might be a turn off, diba? Grabe, mahal. So, that's why they mentioned it as a weakness. Hmm. And then, ito, threats naman. And yeah, I guess one of the things na everyone is thinking right now is, itong work from home, how will this impact the industry in the long run, diba? So, a good point they mentioned here is yeah, 66% na BPOs. That means, uh, and BPOs kasi, they really require, the, the nature of their job, it requires internet connection. It's one of those jobs na, mahir, na mas mahirap talaga if you work from home mo. Especially Philippines, alam mo naman internet connection natin dito, there's much room for improvement pa. So, right now, they feel na this is another way na their risk is managed kasi karamihan BPOs, di ba? So there are some na successful na work from home pero karamihan they're still trying to push na mag-work sa office. And then ito, we we'll move to the industry section. So this is a summary of yung market report na prepared by Colliers. So ito, rental rates, kamusta na ba yung pri- yung rental rates natin here in the Philippines, here in Manila versus neighboring um metro cities and yeah, diba? So we can see from this chart, we actually have one of the lowest rates al- across the region. So, syempre, let's not compare ourselves to Singapore. Sobrang mahal nun. Pero even like Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam, Hanoi in Vietnam, mas mataas pa pala yung rental rates nila versus Manila. And one way to look at this is, if we reach those rates, diba, that's a good potential pa rin for, uh, for Manila, for, property, for, sorry, for offices in Manila that they can charge higher if we go along with um, other regional uh, cities, right? But for that to happen, kailangan reform talaga eh, ba? Na parang ease of doing business, tapos ganda ng economic stage. Oo, oh, ganda ng economic stage natin. Yung, yung, yung economy in, as a general, maganda paggawa ng negosyo. So, itong ano, chart na to, guys and gals, uh, this would be a good indicator kung 
ngayon yung yung mga business people paano nila tinitingnan saan yung demand nila where they wanna set up their businesses so Singapore leader na talaga yan pero it's surprising that Vietnam is number two to think na dati kat, katapat lang ng Pilipinas yan sobrang way behind tayo kalahati 17 lang per ano to per square to no 17 dollars per square si si Ho Chi Minh more than do, halos doble so yun yung premium ni Vietnam. So at, at least it gives us a perspective where we are regionally. Yes, that's correct. So just diba, potentially diba, if we reach their level, we have an a we have a benchmark of where the rental rates might be once they if they improve. Diba? Sana. <laughs> that's a big if, yeah. <laughs> oh my malaking malaking if. So, ito, other parts ng industry report nila, merong BPO industry, kasi syempre 66% BPO, so dapat pag-usapan mo to. So, ito forecast nila for full-time employees ng mga BPOs. So, even though nagka-COVID, and yes, we see, di ba, uh, slower yung growth, pero they forecast na 2020 to, to 2022, mag increase pa rin yung number of full-time employees ng BPOs. Pero siguro add ko lang dito no on sure. on tech projections tech, te- technology acceleration uh hindi ko lang sure kasi baka risk yung upcoming AI yung mga ibang AI gumagawa na ng sariling voice response AI applications or machine learning applications sa sa chatbots nakaka-respond na so given na ang bilis ng progression baka karamihan ng basic customer service is ano mapalitan di ba yung yung dating tao yeah. kaya na sagutan ng technology so keep in mind lang yun hindi naman yan agad-agad na mawawala and i'm sure kahit na nandiyan yung ai or tech tech uh, meron pa ring mga high value services pero siguro magiging factor yan na mas magugro yung ai ser- customer service based versus yung bpo as a whole or not unless makitaan nila ng integration um, yep, so that's a long-term trend that we can consider as another risk in investing, mm-hmm. lalo na here office space, di ba? So ito, they have more discussions on rental rates. So kita naman na Makati, in, on average, over the past 10 years, mas mataas yung rates versus the rest of Metro Manila. 6%, ay, 6% per year? Mm, not sure ano magta-translate dyan, pero As a KGOR of 6.5% sa ilalim. Ayun, okay, yeah. Tama. Mahal. De, sucks lang. Parang triple ng inflation. Pero In kami... In line with their escalation naman, sabi nila diba 3 to 10% per year. Oo. So, gitna. Halos gitna nun. Yep. Tama. Sa inyo ba? Magkano yung ano, increase? Ano eh? Yung kontrata namin, hayop eh. Parang 10, 10%, 10, <laughs> 10% per year yata. So, ano... Sana makausap namin yung tenant namin para mas ano, mas friendly sa startup, hirap, hirap din. So, ito, other key trends na they mentioned, so HQs are on the move to Fort Bonifacio, but mitigated yung risk kasi wala or may lack na of new supply in Makati CBD. Anywhere you look sa Ayala, puro building na, sobrang konti na lang nung hindi pa natatayuan, di ba? So, hirap mag-commute sa Fort Bonifacio, wala pang train lang. <laughs> True. Then ito, some other trends, changes in the BPO industry because of COVID-19. So ito, isa pang risk, yung mga pogos, di ba? Uh, a large part of yung increases over the past years was because nag-increase yung number of pogo tenants. So nagiging mas strict na yung government right now. So that could potentially impact yung increase ng rates in the future, yung demand for office space in the future. Let's see. Kasi recently nagka-boost, dumami yung mga pogo boys. Pero recently rin, mas naging strict. Marami rin nabalita. May mga iba pinapaalis na, di ba? Parang hinahunting-hunting na dahan-dahan. So, let's see on that. Becoming more strict with yung regulations and complying with this. Lala na yung sa tax issue nila, di ba? Uh-huh. Tama so, lang. Ito. Another point to highlight, vacancy rates are expected to hike to 5.5% as the market. So, yan yung estimate ni Colliers as a whole. Okay. Just anong, something to take anong meaning no ano as the market shifts partially to a tenant's market from being a landlord market so yung bargaining power na pupunta oh. na kay tenant versus hmm. sa mga landlords sa mga office operators nag nag-iiba yung power ng demand and, and supply kumbaga dahil mas marami ng options yung tenant 
mas may may bargaining power na siya, di ba? Yes. That's the way to look at it. And then, moving along, they also have a vicinity and site analysis. I mean, huwag na natin isa-isa hinto, pero yan, per property, if you really want to read up on ano yung mga key locations nearby, ano yung accessibility, kamusta, stuff like that, yan, you can read this part. And then finally, it's a reinvestment plan, which we went through now. So yeah, that's the summary of their prospectus, which we went through in, what, 20 minutes? Mga ganun, di ba? Wait, daanan natin pages. rin yung, ano, yung reinvestment plan. An anong, kasi sige, yun yung sige. tanong ng mga tao, eh, di ba? 10% pupunta kay Arit, pero yung 90% kay Ali. Tapos yes, di dito good. makikita kung saan babalak ni Ali gastusin. Mm -hmm. So, ito siya. Ito yung list niya of properties. Saan ba ito, saan ba i-invest ni Ali, ni Ayala Land, yung proceeds na makukuha niya from this read, di ba? So, ito. Kita natin, meron siyang malls mostly, and then may konting offices din, and then meron isang hotel, Seda One Ayala, so it's in Makati. And then sa the next page, meron din silang other hotels, flats, and even warehouse facilities. So completion dates, itong mga i-invest niya, i-zoom in ko lang baka hindi na pala kita, sorry. So ito, mga target completion dates nasa 2021. Some of them are already partially complete actually. So they're just using the funds from the REIT to continue funding these projects, diba? So ito, may mga project din naman na 0% pa lang kasi kaka-launch pa lang, diba? Nakalagay ba dyan yung per, per budget, per project, or wala ka? Nakalista lang sila lahat. Nakalista lang sila. Kita yung total planned use for one year. Wait, tanda. Ah, okay. So yun yung amount. Ito siya. Yeah. So nakalista siya. So sakto, accounted for yung buong 90% na makuha nila. Tama ba? It should be, yes. I think this is one requirement ng PSE and SEC. Okay. So, ayun. In our first treat. Eh. Ayun, from, from, from how I look at it, 10% uh, diretso yung proceed kay ARIT, pambibili niya nung pang-apat na building, pero yung 90% kay Ali mapupunta. So, benefit ni Ali yun pang-develop niya sa projects niya, which not necessarily ipapasok kay ARIT, di ba? Hindi tayo sure. So, si Ali yes. yung main beneficiary nitong ano, nung, ng IPO na to. And actually, most likely, these projects, uh, hindi siya ipapasok kay ARIT. Because remember, we mentioned sa start yung criteria niya na prime office spaces, di ba? Mm, eh, ito mga okay. malls, hotels. So, most likely, hindi yan, hindi yan ipapasok. If ever, they can, however, ano, um, do new REITs or offer new REITs mm -hmm. you know, specifically for malls or specifically for hotels. But not right now, right? Okay. So, isa lang. So, yan. That's the prospectus. Alright. So, so, from what we've done, we've covered the 800 pages ng prospectus. Usually, Ray, sa mga nadadaanan mong prospectus, ilang page yan besides dito? Usually, umaabot siya 200 to 300 without the appendix. Mm. Itong prospectus ito without the, without the appendix, nasa 400. Okay. So, mahaba talaga ang daming disclosures kasi first first ever. So, they want to make sure na they comply with all the regulations din. Ayun. So, so I hope na natutunan nyo, uh, dinaanan namin kayo kung paano ba tumingin ng mabilis sa isang prospectus. Kasi usually, tayo, sanay tayo, technical analysis or yung mga disclosures lang. Pero, di ba, kapag gusto talaga natin mag-analyze for the long term, makakatulong to kasi nakikita natin ano yung mga business risks, mga projections, saan ginagamit yung capital, uh, ano mga tips mo, Ray, on, on for, for our community? Kapag tumingin sila sa prospectus, ano yung mga important segments na dapat daanan? So, pag tumingin sa prospectus, definitely go through yung summary terms. That's number one. And for this point, we didn't go through yung summary terms anymore kasi nagawa na natin yung sa term sheet last video, ba? Yeah. And then, once you have yung summary terms, then you will have more questions for sure, ba? And once you have those questions, then tingin lang, Ang suggestion ko is, tingin ka muna dun sa table of contents, saan ka mula hanapin tong information na to. So if yung question mo is more on yung business niya, parang ano bang ini-invest na nitong company na to, ayun, pun punta ka diretso sa business section, ba? If yung question mo is more on, kamusta ba yung industry ng company na to, then yun, try to go to the industry section, of course, right? Magandang tip then, yun. So you start from Siyempre, the questions. Yep. 
And then, syempre, daanan mo yung risk factors because there's a very good reason why that's there. It's for you as an investor to know the risks of what you are investing in. So, yung risk factors, marami dyan mga copy-paste lang makikita mo across, let's say, itong one specific risk factor, makikita mo siya in 10 prospectuses kasi ganun ka-standard lang talaga siya. So, yung mga ganun, kita mo naman sa heading na parang, ah, hindi to company-specific, in general, risk lang talaga yan in investing. Skip mo na yun. Go to yung risks na specific to the business para save time ka. Alright. So, anong next natin, Ray? So, siguro ito yung inaantay na ng ano, ng ng karamihan. So, ano natutunan nyo paano tumingin ng prospectus? Ngayon naman, ito na yung tanong. So, ano ba yung recommendation namin? Ano yung verdict 